In this video, we're going to look at 20 quick Unity tips in just 10 minutes. All right, so let's begin. All right, so let's begin with tip number one. Use a white pixel in order to visualize sprite renders. So in the hierarchy, if you right click, create a 2D object and make it a sprite. If you do, then you can't see anything. That is because the sprite render doesn't render anything if over here on the sprite field, there's nothing assigned. So an extremely useful thing to have is to have a simple white pixel texture. And if you drag it, and there you go, now it's visible, you can stretch it, you can paint it into any color, and so on. So this is literally a texture, just a one by one white pixel, which you can make it in Paint or Photoshop or really any imaging program. Tip number two, use the Inspector Debug View. Now, when making your scripts, if you're following clean code principles, then most of your fields should be set to private. Now, making them private is great, but it also means that they don't show up in the editor, which can sometimes be useful. However, there's a really interesting way to see that. Just go over here on these three dots and change the inspector from normal into debug. Using that, we can now inspect all three private fields and see the value that they have stored. Now, as another bonus tip, you can also make multiple inspectors. So go up here, right click, click on add tab, add another inspector. And for example, you could have a normal inspector and then next to it, a debug inspector. So there it is, very useful. Now, tip number three, you can automatically create the material to use a specific shader. So down here in my project files, I have a very simple shader. And now when you want to make a material, you might go into the folder that you want to place it in, right click, go into create and create a new material. So that creates a material. Then over here, you go into shader and select your actual shader. So that works. But another quick shortcut is to right click directly on top of the shader and create the new material. And it automatically creates it using that shader. Tip number four, learn about the buttons to swap between pivot and center and local and global. So this is something you absolutely must know, otherwise it will drive you crazy. Up here on the top left corner, you see these two buttons. So this one, as you click, it changes from pivot to center. And this one changes from global to local. Now this affects where the handles are positioned in the scene view. So here, let me create just a random object. So here it is, just an object with two channel sprites inside it. And now if I select on the parent, and over here it is set to pivot, then the handle shows up on the actual pivot of this object. However, if I click on it and select the center, now it's over there in the center. So for example, down here, this little white dot is on 0, 0, 0. And then let's say I want to place this parent also on 0, 0, 0. Then if I were to go over here and place it on 0, 0, 0, then if you didn't know about these, you would be very confused as to why the position is on 0, 0, 0, but the handle is not. So this can cause a ton of confusion. And it works the same on all the others. So for example, if I rotate over here on the Z, I would be very confused as to why it is not rotating exactly where the handle is placed. So again, keep in mind on these two, and usually you probably want to keep it always on the pivot. Then the next one is the global and local. So for example, over here, I have added some rotation into the parent game object, but all of the other ones do not have any rotation. And now if I select global, then on the child, we see the handle is exactly like this. So they are oriented according to the global position space. So in here, as I move to the right, it's moving to the right. However, let's say that I wanted to move the child alongside the axis of the parent. Now using this, it's very tricky since you would have to pick both of them and visually try to make it exactly perfect. So that is why you have the second button to transform into local and now you can modify this handle and there you go, it moves along the axis. So again, if you experience some strange behavior with your handles, always make sure to double check to see that you are in the correct modes. Next up, the hierarchy visibility button. So down here, we have our nice hierarchy window. We can see a list of all the game objects present in this scene. And you can also see some white space over here on the left side. Now, these are actually two separate buttons. Now, for example, here I have my game with a canvas on top. Now, the canvas usually puts it in a corner in there. So this is my normal canvas, and I simply have a button on the lower left corner. So that works great. However, if I'm trying to edit something in the actual world space, then right here it gets quite confusing because I can't really look underneath that one. So you can easily go into the canvas and use the button on the left side in order to actually hide it. So this one hides the canvas so I can now play around in the actual world without being bothered by what's on the canvas. And now the important thing is that this only affects the scene view. So if I go into the game view, yep, over here it still looks the same. There's the button still on the lower left corner. So this button toggles the scene visibility for any game object so you can get a clear view of what you're working on. And related to that is the button next to it, which is the hierarchy unlock button. So let's say I have a huge background sprite down there. And now let's say I want to deselect the object that I'm currently selecting. So I want to deselect this. And if I do, when I try to click on the empty space, I can't do it since there's really no empty space. So by clicking in there, I just select the background. 
So over here on the hierarchy on the background game object, we press on this button. And now this means that we can no longer touch on this actual object. So if I click on it, now it's the same thing as clicking on empty space. So if I had this object selected, I move it. Now I want to deselect, I can click on there and yep, it works. And again, this only affects the scene view and not the game view. So these two buttons are really great for helping you easily play around as you're making your scene. On to the next tip, use anonymous lambda functions in order to make your code more compact. So lambda functions are extremely compact, which makes them perfect for many scenarios. For example, over here, adding some behavior to a button click. So like this, it works. You access the button, you add a listener, and you define the function that's going to listen to that event. So when you click on the button, you're going to trigger this function, okay. However, if you had tons of buttons, this would be quite a lot of work. You would have to write a separate function for every single button. So instead, you can make this a lot more compact by using a lambda function. And yep, there it is. Over here, we have the exact same thing that we have down here. So we have a function that takes no parameters. And then inside, we have our code block. And in this case, we just have a comment. So you can use lambda functions whenever you need a delegate. So another use case is when dealing with events. Let's say you don't want to define an actual function, so you can do plus equals and over here write down the signature. And yep, there you go, exactly like that. So lambda functions are extremely useful for making your code more compact. If you want to learn more, go watch the video where I cover delegates in detail. Next step, you can destroy a script with destroy. Now, for example, let's say you want to run some code after the very first update. So you make the script, it does something on late update, and over here we want to do it just once. And in order to do that, you can simply just call destroy. And over here, we pass in this, which is going to pass in the reference to this particular script. And if you run it like this, so here, let's create an empty game object. Let's attach a script onto it and run the code. And if there it is, the object no longer has that script. So the object itself still exists, but only the script was destroyed. So this can be useful when, for example, a unit dies, but you want to keep the visuals playing some sort of death animation. You can just destroy the AI script and leave the rest. Next step, debug.drawline. Now you probably already know that debug.log is extremely useful. However, did you know that the debug class also has more functions? So if you just go here, click on that, you can see all the various functions. There you go, a ton of logs. And over here, we also have a really interesting draw line. So this will draw a gizmo line, which can be very useful for visualizing the state of your scripts. So for example, let's say I had a script that handled some pathfinding. So it got a list of paths. And with this, you could use debug.drawline in order to draw a visual representation of the path. So here, just cycling through the path and drawing a line between the current position onto the next position. And yep, over here, we can see the inner workings of that class. So we can see that we have a path going from there, 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 there. So it's a really useful tool when you have some debug info that you want to show with some visual rather than just some text. Also, when you're on the game view, make sure you go up here and enable gizmos. Otherwise, the debug.drawline does not actually show. All right, so time's almost up, so let's go through some quickfire tips. You can hit shift space to go full screen. So over here, I have a shaded graph window, so I click on it in order to select it, then press shift space in order to toggle on full screen. So very useful to work around on shaded graph, then go back and go back into the game scene. Next one, you can hit control D in order to duplicate any object. So it works in the project files, and it also works over here on the hierarchy. For another one, you can press F2 to rename something. Again, works with the hierarchy and also with the project files. Next on the console right here, if you select on these ones, you can go into log entry and over here, select the number of lines you want for the log. So here are two log messages and you can set it to one in order to keep it really nice and compact. But if you want to see a ton of text, you can set it to many more lines. And there you go, now it shows that one. Now it shows that one, it shows where it happened, the script that happened and so on. Next up, use the widget to modify the collider size. So over here, I've got a queue with a box collider. You can click on this button. And there you go, now it shows a bunch of dots that you can grab. So click and drag. And there you go, you can set the collider to exactly the same size that you want without having to touch here on the numbers for the center and the size. Also related to that, you have the polygon collider, which you can still add a whole bunch of points anywhere on your shape. And if you want to delete them, you hold down Control, and then you click anywhere on the line. Now just keep in mind, you have to click on the line in order to delete and not on top of the point. If you click on top of the point, nothing happens. Have to click on the line in order to delete it. For a simple one, you can press the F key in order to focus on an object. So really simple. And if you get lost, it really helps when you don't know where a certain object is. So just like on a hierarchy, press F and there you go. It goes straight onto the object. And if you want to position your game camera, you can use the scene controls in order to position the scene camera exactly where you want it. Then select the main camera object and press Control, Shift and F. And there you go, the camera automatically matches what the scene camera is seeing. 
So move the scene camera to exactly where you want, press Ctrl Shift F, there you go. Next up, you can enable or disable the select object by going over here and pulling on this toggle, okay? And also you can use a shortcut, Alt Shift A. So there you go, it just toggles the visibility of this game object. And regarding gizmos, which are the various icons and lines that you can see here, as you know, you can enable or disable them, but then you can also click on this area to see some more options. And very importantly, up here you have a button to swap between 2D or 3D gizmos. So right now it's 3D, so they're almost invisible. And if I click, yep, there you go, now they become 2D, and now they are visible no matter how much I zoom out. Or alternatively, switch to 3D and massively increase the size. All right, so that's 10 minutes. Okay, so that was quite a lot of tips, and I hope you found some helpful ones that you didn't know about. Now, as I was gathering this list, I came up with many more tips, so let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a part 2. Alright, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time!